Uh, thanks for coming to the talk. So my um, my name is Raymond. So I want to share with you my experience on using functional programming with Scala. So, uh, but before I do that, uh, just a show of hands. How many of you have uh, uh, experienced uh, development with Scala before? Okay. Okay. So in a minority, great, great. That means there's a lot of room for growth. So, uh, have any of you ever heard of functional programming at all? Okay, so you basically heard and then did nothing about it. <laughs> Great. So, okay, don't get me wrong, functional programming and object-oriented programming are tools. They are tools. But functional programming sometimes depends on your, you know, your personality and your mileage, whatever it is. It can take a bit, uh, it can be a bit hard to catch up or catch on. Sometimes the language plays a part, sometimes you don't really like the syntax, or etc. So this session is really my sharing my experience on Scala with you. So uh, a little bit, bit more about me. Um, I work in HP Labs, same as uh, Sao Chong. I, was, I saw him, but he's probably drowned over by people over there. Oh, okay. So um, I work in the same lab as Sao Chong, so he's my boss. He gave me a lot of liberty into using the coolest cutting edge technologies like Scala to actually build systems. So I'm actually building a big data platform that uses Scala, uh, as well as concurrency library called ECA, as well as Play, the web framework, and finally, Slick. Slick is actually an ORM written in a functional style to connect to databases, basically. So, but before we go there, I'd like to take a few minutes of your time to watch this uh, very interesting uh, video, which I found. This guy is called Eric Mayer. Eric Mayer is the uh, lead architect for Microsoft Lean Q, as well as Microsoft SQL. This is a conversation between himself and Simon Payton Jones. Simon Payton Jones is the. Uh, sorry. Oh. Okay. Ooh, it was turned off. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So um, I'd like to share with you a very short, probably a six-minute video between himself, Eric Mayer, and uh, Simon Payton Jones. Simon Payton Jones is the uh, core contributor to Haskell himself, and it's an interesting conversation because. It talks about how programming languages will converge. And the two of them actually talk about basically how it will converge together. So uh, hopefully the video works. Into here in Cambridge. I follow you around. You didn't know that? Yeah, oh, you're my groupie now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but yeah. <laughs> okay. And we got a lot of them on, on nine. And we're Can here you guys hear the audio? Again. Oh, correct. How you doing? Good to see you again. Nice to see you. So, uh, What's going on? Yeah, it's on a much so, more. So one of the things I've been thinking well, about recently is we've got this, uh, oh, this big right. picture going. I'm going, to, I'm going to draw a picture of like this. We've got, uh, and we've got uh, ones that are uh, uh, useful. Useful, and here's ones that are useless. Okay. <laughs> and here's one. Okay, so the guy who's, saying, who's drawing this thing now is Simon Payton Jones, the uh, lead contributor to Haskell himself. Yeah. Ones that are uh, um, unsafe, and these ones that are safe. Okay, by, by, and by which I mean safe, I mean very limited effects. Effects, I mean, um, I mean side effects. Side effects. Limited, uh, controlled effects. And this is any effects anywhere. And this is this up here is C, right? Okay. Um, and down here is Haskell. But actually, also here is C Sharp and Java and C++. Pretty much every mainstream language is in this useful but unsafe camp. Now let's talk about that for a second. Even C Sharp? Oh, sure. Uh -huh. C Sharp. Uh, the, uh, the, what does a C Sharp program do? It's an imperative program. It's a sequence of steps. Every line says, do this, then do this, do this. When you call a method, 
often it has no argument, so no result. It may have some arguments, but no result. And why? Because it's um, because its sole reason for calling it is to have an effect on the world, to change the state of something. Interesting. So it's fundamentally effectful. Okay. Um, so and this is a very powerful computing paradigm. What our machines do, after all, it's incredibly useful. In fact, it's absolutely. So what we're, what we'd like to well, what we'd like to go is here. This is Nirvana. Right. Well, they're both safe and useful. Okay. Right. And and uh, the real world has been gradually moving in this kind of direction in all sorts of ways over time. Um, in fact, um, becoming more and more controlled. I think uh, transactional memory is a good example of this, where we want to say, well, inside a transaction, it would really be so much better if we could uh, we could control, uh, we could make sure that we don't do, say, arbitrary input output. That's arbitrary effects. Mm -hmm. Because inside a transaction, you want to make sure we don't launch the missiles until you've seen a cons consistent view of memory. So that's an example of what I mean by limited effect. Uh -huh. Or you might like a procedure, and you might like to say, I know this procedure uh, is a pure function. In fact, some languages maybe even are getting pure annotations. Compilers can do a lot with those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is like where link is also moving, right? right. Where right. You... Good. Exactly. So, because in, in expressions, in the, the query comprehensions, you want to be there. You want to have no side effects because then the yeah. compiler can do much more optimizations or you know send it to SQL where you know you don't know what happens there. So, so indeed, SQL is, is a language. Yeah. So, so there's little sub-languages that have become quite mainstream and very useful that have controlled effects. But at the moment, they're all embedded in large languages that have unrestricted effects. But nonetheless, there's, there's, a, there's a big trend. The more, and the, and the more we think about parallelism, too, the more we need to control effects. Because if you have unrestricted effects, you do things in parallel, mm -hmm. then, uh, then you don't know what the result of the program is going to be. Absolutely. So from the other end of the, end of the world, as, as you know, us sort of geeky Haskell guys have started with completely useless language. <laughs> right? no effect. In the end, a program with no effect, there's no point in running it. You know, you have this black box, and you press go, and it says, uh, you know, it, it gets hot, but there's no output. It's, why did you run the program? The reason to run a program is to have an effect. Sure. Right? So, but nevertheless, we put up with that embarrassment for many years until we figured out <laughs> how to combine in a single language, a single programming method, but we can combine effectful computations and effect free ones without making them pollute each other. Interesting. Right? The type system keeps them apart. So that so so we've been working from that direction. Everyone else is working from this direction. But there's a lot of cross fertilization going on here. Mm -hmm. We got the idea of STM, the transactional memory stuff, sure. from the imperative world. Mm -hmm. We uh, thought about it over here and added retry and all else, and are busy putting that back into the imperative world. Nice. There's quite a bit of cross fertilization going on. Uh -huh. Or the other one with the comprehensions, right? That came from here, or that came from there right. to here and back. Right. 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 So now you know Haskell's comprehensions are kind of you know getting ideas from the C-sharp and VB comprehensions and putting them in. Well, let's talk about that briefly, comprehensions, definition. Oh, comprehensions, the, the, the query expressions. Okay. And, 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 and the comprehensions is the geeky word that comes from, you know, from Haskell. Um, so, yeah. So, Simon just wrote a paper uh, with Phil Wattler where they kind of extend the Haskell comprehensions with order by and group by, which is something that we introduced in C-sharp and VB. Where we took the idea, original idea from comprehensions from Haskell. So, it's a kind of nice, uh, you know. Okay, at this point I want to stop because they're going to keep patting each other on their backs and keep on graduating all how you have advanced the use of C Sharp because of me and how Haskell became more useful because of you. So we're going to stop this video for now. So. Okay, so come to the subject matter functional programming with Scala. So this man here is the uh, dictator of Scala. His name is Martin Odersky. He's the guy who created Scala himself. So if you can recognize uh, this uh, photo cover, it's actually from uh, Lemis. Instead of, uh, we change this thing to Itro. <laughs> so if any one of you can catch the, uh, the, <laughs> the irony inside it, it'd be fantastic. So uh, a few things I want to talk about, uh, about in, in inside here is that, uh, or, or rather I should say, a few things I don't want to talk about is actually syntax per se, per se. You can't learn a language in 30 minutes, especially when you don't have a laptop, especially you don't have a Scala interpreter on it. But what, what I want to share with you are core concepts, concepts in functional programming that, are, that can be transferred to the next functional programming language that you want to use. Because all these are core concepts that, uh, that sort of have been around since the 1960s, uh, profounded by Alonso Church, Haskell Curry, and so and so forth, to, to this day. It's just a matter of uh, 
the, the, the different uh, implementations that you see today are different manifestations of the age-old concepts. Okay? Feel free to interject me at any point in time with questions. Okay? So about me. Basically, I write code. I write code in, uh, in HP Labs and in all of my previous jobs because that's what they pay me to do. So, fortunately. Okay. The, the, uh, the code samples for this talk is actually on this GitHub. If you like to uh, look at it, actually you can go download it. There's a couple of, uh, there's actually quite a lot of um, code snippets that I cover from data structures to computation to ad hoc concurrency to, to uh, implicit concurrency and so on and so forth. So some of the snippets that I'll be showing you today will be coming from this repo itself. So feel free to, uh, you know, to use it. Okay. So these, are the, these are the set of technologies uh, in Scala and who are using it. So be, you know, the reason for this slide is, uh, to the slide is actually to, to, to allow me to tell you that Scala existed for a purpose. It is not some useless language that nobody uses and is only done by really men with old white beards. So um, you can see the top, right? The play and the spring, all these are actually web uh, frameworks that is actually being done uh, by open source contributors. Maybe some of you are here today. Uh, and some of the technologies like uh, ORM, like uh, Slick, SORM, Squirrel. Some of you, uh, these are the companies that are using it today. Uh, just now, Justin Mann, the CTO of Bubbly, gave uh, a talk, so he was also using Scala as well. Yan Ring is also using Scala because uh, the chief architect is actually my, uh, who I'm actually working with him to co-author a book on Acker as well. So MongoDB and Redis are two of the document databases and key value stores that are actually, they actually have Scala drivers, so you can write Scala code to drive programs against your data store. So these are just some of the technologies that's actually being out there that's quite widely widely used by a lot of folks. So LinkedIn. LinkedIn is obviously, I mean everybody has a LinkedIn account, right? Why well, who doesn't? You should really go get one. I don't work for LinkedIn anyway. So Twitter, Twitter is one of my uh, favorite resources for using open source Scala projects. Uh, part, a lot of my part, uh, sorry, my past uh, Scala projects were done using open source stuff from Twitter. So extremely robust, powerful, uh, expressive, and stuff like this. Okay. Any question? Okay. So the next question is: Is Scala the you know just a fad? Is it a fashion item? Will it just go away? I, in my opinion, I don't think so. So this is a job trends uh, sort of uh, graph with this, uh, uh, they're sort of uh, telling me, you know, based, in, based on a, it's actually like a job site search, right? You enter Scala job search and then it will tell you, uh, okay, this obviously there's none because it wasn't really popular at the time. So about then, I first heard of Scala. At the time I was with a, with a company in the San Francisco Bay Area and I wanted to use it, but obviously the guys were like, don't, this is not your toy stuff, don't put anything inside, that isn't production really. So after that, you can see that actually there's a lot of uh, job demands. Unfortunately, I have to qualify, this job is taken off from the, uh, the US job site. So I'm not sure how many Scala jobs are here in Singapore. I was fortunate to be part of uh, two startups uh, that use Scala, but I'm not sure of any other you know, startups that are using Scala. Banks. Who? Investment banks. Okay. Uh, I know BOA, Bank of America. Any Bank of America guys here? Okay, probably you are with your managers as well. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. The first thing about functional programming you will ever learn is the concept of immutability. So we all know from the English word that immutability simply means that once an object is being given a value, you cannot change its value. Now in Scala, it's a bit different. Scala comes from Java, in a sense, but it is not like a syntax sugar that wraps around the JVM. It actually has a language spec, I have to say. So in Scala, it allows you to write 
uh, two forms of functional code, the object-oriented way and the functional way. So in, in Scala itself, right, in order to allow interoperability with uh, JVM and Java programs, it needs to cater to this concept of a variable. So you need to have something that varies over time. Because Java programmers have been so used to passing state, keeping a global state where multiple threads can access without synchronization that we thought, you know, it's, a, it's a really a bad problem, but they still need to keep it. Because there are still good Java developers around. The users as well. So val. Val is the uh, Scala way of saying that this is immutable. Okay, but there's a twist. The twist is this. If this is uh, taken from uh, REPL, the REPL is actually uh, you know, uh, evaluating group, uh, it's a Scala interpreter they can run on the command line, which is my recommended way for learning Scala, as you are reading through a book, you know, and you are trying out all, all the scores. So if you see, right, the, the first code snippet tells you that the difference between this and this is that there's a strong difference between uh, what is immutable, an immutable reference as compared to an immutable object. This is unfortunate because it inherits from Java. So for Java programmers, you know you can do the same thing. Val in Java is nothing more than final variables, right? But you know that the final variable can be attached to a mutable uh, collection. So it's, it's something like that. So when you are approaching immutability from Scala, it's very important for you to understand between immutable references and immutable objects. In Haskell, you don't really have this problem. Actually, I'm not saying you don't really, you don't really have, you don't have this problem at all, <laughs> okay? But in Scala, these are some of the things that you need to watch out, okay? Any questions on this? So, I, I should explain what I'm doing. So, the, the first code samples is trying to do this thing. It's um, I'm creating a hash map which is basically like a tree, like a hash table. So that in the hash table, I need to have a key, I need to have a value. So I'm saying inside, inside X, I want to in add this pair, which is actually a key value pair. So this is a Scala syntax of saying that I want to add a key value pair into my object. So this is the same thing. So the, the key thing again is to illustrate to you the differences between references and objects in Scala itself. Okay? Now the second the second core concept of functional programming is actually side effects. Just how you met you saw the video, Simon Payton Jones was saying that functional programs uh, in order to be useful must generate side effects. It is inevitable. Otherwise, it will just be a black box. It keeps getting hot, keeps getting hot, and there's no output. You have no idea what's happening, right? So, now, the side effects is very important uh, when you're writing functional programming in the sense that for those who have done it for a number of years, you actually will know, uh, you'll notice three things. First is that there's a lot of code reuse. Okay, people, code reuse is like a misnomer when it comes to object-oriented programming, right? So, but when you think about it, when you write object-oriented programming, what are you doing? You are actually writing some kind of a person class, and then you say the person has particular attributes, and then you put the person into a collection, and then you, what will you do next? You actually iterate over the collection of people, right? And do something with it, right? So you're actually creating side effects all, all over the shop. So, but when you are writing uh, side effect free, uh, we are not talking about I.O. here, so we are talking about creating immutable objects in that sense. It actually promotes code reuse, because um, not only is Scala or Camel, Haskell, or whatever functional programming language you use, it allows the computation to be lifted out from the object, so that the code looks like, I just need to say, put this object, throw it into a function, and I'll tell it what the function is, and then it will do it for me. I'm going to show you examples of what I meant by this in a, in a short one. Now, when functions are written like this, right, it actually makes better building blocks because now the function becomes reusable. Right? When, you, when you always iterate over a collection, you always do a for loop, either a while loop or a for loop, right? 
but you always couple them with your programs. When you're writing search for function, search for person, you always say, uh, you know, public search for person and passing the person a collection and it's looking for something inside it. But you cannot reuse this piece of code. Why? Because the object and the computation is tied together. You cannot break it out, right, and say that search for person and then throw it a collection of dogs. It doesn't make sense. Right? It's because of the semantics thing. The meaning doesn't stay. But what functional programming does for you is that it lifts off this concept by giving it a name in 1960. It says this name is called map. So you give me a map. Uh, the map takes in two things. First, a collection and a function. Now this map concept can be reused in everywhere else because it segregates computation from object representation. I'm, I'm gonna show you examples later on what I mean by this. So it's very important uh, why uh, there was a swing now. Uh, I'm not sure how significant that swing is from, from using uh, object-oriented programming techniques to using functional programming techniques. One of the benefits is actually this, for code reuse and better building blocks. Now, the last point is actually um, side effect free functions are definitely easier to reason about because now you can write unit tests the test for the exact input given, uh, sorry, exact outcome given a particular input without worrying whether some thread is, or is, is changing the state of my program or not. So this is what it means. Second is optimizing and uh, optimizing itself. So you have to take my word for it that, that actually it does work better because there's countless uh, research papers and implementations that are being, being done. So it actually, side effect free functions actually, actually run faster, okay? So, let's see some actual code. Now when we say, in, in functional programming, the, the, the first few concepts you will always hear are immutability, side effect free functions, and all these are based on, uh, and then the second concept is actually functions as a first class citizen. In Java, objects is a first class citizen, right? You pass in objects around, then you play with the methods in the objects. But in functional programming, you pass functions around. Then you put objects to operate on uh, with the functions. Uh. So let's go through. Let's let's uh, let's let's go through what, what I'm trying to do. Now this is the Java uh, Scala syntax for defining a function, which begins with def. So I'm I'm trying to say. I want to uh, uh, create a function that says multiply four. That means given an argument, which I don't know why it is yet, I want to say, you give me whatever it is, I just want to multiply by four. Then I'll tell it that I'm expecting an argument. The reason is because when four multiplies by something, I need to, because multiplication is a binary operator, right? You need to say this and this, right? Marriages are not necessarily binary relationships. Right? <laughs> so, uh, the other one is actually add two. So add two again has the has the same uh, concept. I just want to add two, the number two, to any argument I like. But the next thing is actually, if I want to build an abstraction to say that I want to do this, I want to multiply four first, followed by add two. What do I do? Now you can do. This is the Scala syntax of saying. I give it a a symbol. I, I said, uh, it's actually from the Unicode. And I say that it takes in three parameters. I don't know what they are now, but I'll give them a name, A, B, and C. And I'll say, the first is actually a function, because this arrow says that F is a function that takes in a value of type A, returns a B. So the next one is function G takes in a value of type B, returns a C. And then I will say, what do I mean by this? This means I want to execute F followed by G. In Scala, it actually type checks. So what, what it does is actually, oh, you want to do this, right, first. So I'm expecting an A, and I'll return a B. The return value from B will be pumped back into the function G over here to achieve this computation called C. Now, if you notice, right, this is generic. You can do anything you want to it, right? 
You can imagine emailing this piece of code, impressing your friends. This can do anything. It really can do anything. Okay? You can send them around. This is what I meant by code reuse. These are just one of the simple examples of code reuse. Now, over here, let's string them up. I will say, I create a new function. I want to say that, okay, I want to do this first followed by this. Okay, then I will use my previous definition over here. I'll pass it multiplied by 4 and F2. Okay, but this doesn't look very nice, in my opinion. We will see later how I'm going to make it uh, look more natural. So, this is the new function that says F. F is a composition of two functions, right? You take multiply by 4 and add 2. But you notice, uh, where are the arguments? Where? They're not there yet. You've just created your first high order function. You basically created a function that takes in other functions that does other things. Now this piece of code is reusable because you still don't know what the argument is going to be. Now let's see how it's going to manifest itself. If I want to evaluate it, I will say f pass in a variable for. Now this whole expression is type C because it knows I'm not expecting a double or a long or a float. Because I already told it that this is going to be an integer, right? So this is one of the ways that actually uh, it's actually called parametric polymorphism. This is one of the features that Scala has to allow you to construct higher order functions. Okay. Now you you may wonder why is this important? Because it not only promotes code reuse, but it promotes the concept of chaining a function. Now it, whenever you are you're doing J two E programming, right? or surflet programming, you always have to see for events. You stack, right? You stack your chain of events, then you run through them one by one, based on the input, filter off my HTTP request, or body, or header, whatever it is, right? But in Java syntax, it's very clunky. It's very clunky. The computation is not generic, because you can only apply to HTTP objects, right? So, it, what this is saying is that you can do anything to it. Because A, B, and C just means uh, it can be anything at all. Okay. Now the last one is uh, is like, so you may be asking me the question, you mean everything I have to do like this? Huh? I have to write my own stuff. Uh, luckily, the guys at types actually made it very uh, easier. They call this, they gave it a name already. So the name is called composition, compose. So I would say add to compose with multiply four. So this last expression is actually part of the Scala standard library. But you see, Scala gave you an additional power. It gives you the power to create your own higher order functions if you don't like what they uh, gave you. Oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, there was a bit too much. Anybody has a problem? Any questions? Please ask. So far, uh, OK? OK. Yeah. Yes, but my talk is on Scala. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, the, sorry, I need to repeat your question because it's uh, for the record. So the question is, uh, other languages can do this as well. So why does this make it special, right, in that case? So, um, well, coming from, I have to take the perspective from a JVM developer, a Java developer. Now, in a Java world, right, if you want to construct something like this, you can do it. You can use it through generics. You can construct it through generics itself. But generics has a, has a problem. The generics doesn't understand variance that well. Variance is actually another concept which I won't, I won't touch on inside here. But variance is very important for functions to be able to pass on to other functions. Okay, but thank you for the question. I think the biggest difference is, like you said, the other function is the first class object. Right? Yep. That's where the whole uh, difference arises in a data focused yep. language. Versus. Yes, so the, the okay. uh, I, um, so to repeat, he basically supports the idea that this is a much better way of doing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, any other questions? Yeah.
Yes, you can do it. Uh, also, the question is, why re? So, sort of. Uh, the question is, uh, Java has uh, inheritance, so I can create something similar using Java's standard way of inheritance, right? Yes. Um, to answer you, yes, you can do that, but you can only accomplish this using Java generics, because the generics allow you to decide the function arguments and the return the return type. But there is a limitation with the generics itself because it doesn't understand variance and contra variance very well. So if you write code that is very complicated, right? This thing you have to write a lot of. What what you see in the end in your Java code is that you will keep writing brackets something extend something. Then you bracket again inside it extend something bracket again bracket again bracket again. So Scala in this case it makes the syntax more, how do you call that, simplified in the sense. It allows you to reason it better. Instead of, you know, otherwise I would hire a Java programmer, test him on generics and stuff, then he'll be smoking his way through because I'll be like, right? I mean, that's going to be one situation. Yeah. And any other questions? Yes? How do you compare this to list? Oh, you asked the wrong man. I'm so sorry. Uh, sorry, to answer your question, uh, I haven't tried uh, lists yet. Okay, Ruby? Ah, uh, no. Ruby doesn't really cut it for me. I'm a old school kind of guy. You know, types. Ruby gives a lot of lists in time. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I really don't know how they come back. Any, any, yes? Yeah, in object oriented programmer, right, we start thinking about the object and then it will be the Right. So in this case, we have to think about the machine. Yes. Oh. Okay. So uh, the question was in, in Java programming, I always start from thinking from the object's perspective. So in Scala, does it mean that I have to start thinking from the function's perspective? Uh, answer is yes and no. When you're starting out uh, writing Scala programs, you, you often write simple stuff like this. But then you will question yourself, what if A is an object, right? So if an A is an object, maybe a list of something, does it, you know, what do I think about next? And then the list can become an uh, object of your own. It's a user-defined domain, right? Then you think about how they interact. In this case, you have to use uh, you can also think in terms of function in a sense, but it really de depends where you're coming from, in a sense. So I definitely agree with you personally that when I write, and when I start out with Scala, I always write simple functions. Then I ask myself the question, what can A become? And how do I constrain A to be this but not that? That is the concept of variance and uh, contravariance, so, which I won't touch on. So this means anything. Yes. So in, in uh, for example, C level plus right, right. we pass a we call a function finder, so we can pass the function as an argument. Right. So but here also we can pass a function as an argument. So what yes. is the difference? Between, uh, between? Well, okay. Um, can't really comment on that. So you're talking about function objects. Yeah. Right in C plus plus right. Function objects in C plus plus does not emulate the concept of a function object in the regular sense of the word in, in uh, functional programming. Okay. So functions in C++ are actually, uh, is somebody coined the name because they actually yeah. act as a default function that you run okay. that creates some sort of side effect. But remember, yeah. there is a side effect yeah. inside it. So in order not to, there's actually a class of uh, theory and actually as well as an implementation that touches on this part, which I think uh, we can go on to it. Uh, you know, offline. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, how about you, Russ? Good question, good question. So the question was, 
um, in a lot of functional programming stuff, the, the key thing that I talked about was uh, side effect free functions. But they are real world problems that has stake in it. So how do we deal with stake per se? How do we create, safely create side effects? Um, I can tell you, if you code it using Scala standard technique, uh, some of it, it can be hidden away, but it won't be functional, uh, functional in the sense that it creates, uh, it guarantees you immutability. There's a class, there's a library called the Scala Z library, created by Tony Morris, uh, Paul Chusano, and uh, some other guys, famous guys in Scala community. So Scala Z provides you this concept. They, they actually provided the implementation called the state monad and the IO monad. So the, these two monads are actually uh, functional structures for you to actually safely traverse and actually propagate state and conducting IO without and still having site, site free effects. So um, in the uh, when you know when you write programs, you always have state, right? You always have need to manage state. So one of the ways the state monad says you should manage state is you generate a new state plus the value and the state generate. So this is what the state monad is telling you. So uh, I I won't show you the, the the code snippets here. You probably can download it from the GitHub and have a look yourself. But the state generator in the state monad it basically says. I give you a value, you return me two things, the next subsequent value and the generator to generate the next subsequent value. Now, why is this important? You'll be saying that it's like, it's like, it's like uh, repeating this whole cycle, right? What does it matter? The problem is this thing called immutability. In order to reason about something, the state of your program in a safe manner, you need to have immutability, right? Otherwise, uh, well, in, well in, the, in, the, in the development teams that I've been with, um, one argument, right, one developer will always pinpoint the other developer for saying, look, you created some, you didn't synchronize the code. My thread is assessing it and changing the state, right? Okay? Any other questions? Uh, just a question. Right. In Scala syntax, whenever you want to create some kind of a parametric, parametric means many parameters, and polymorphic, meaning parameters can, can do many, many things, it has to have a way to tell it what type of types am I expecting. So the syntax over here is to say that this is the open bracket, you say that, okay, you are expecting these three parameters. In, in Java slang, A is an object. Is the Java dot length dot object. Okay? So B is the same, C is the same. So this is Scala's way of saying that you're expecting three different types of objects that can last these strings. However, if you do just want monomorphic parametric function, you will just say A. And then here becomes A, 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 A. That means you can only do one type of composition. Ah, okay. Because it doesn't understand what you're trying to do here. But here, you give it meaning. Right? So, it's just like when you write a Java program, because it's a bit different, right? You always pass objects around. So, you don't really see the methods because the, the types are hidden in the, of the methods themselves. Right? When you create a class for class person, you define a method for the person and something else. That function's meaning is embedded in the class. But here, you're lifting out, you're lifting this thing out to say, I don't know what these guys are, but I know that this and this should be the same because I want to create this. Yeah, it's a placeholder. Any other questions? Okay. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Ah, okay, this is the, the Unicode thing. So we can talk about this offline. You can come, I'll show you how to include the Unicode. Okay. But actually, this thing actually means equal and a greater sign. You can also input this the same. Okay. Okay. So, uh, sorry, we need to probably move on a bit. So, now the next uh, concept is actually the idea of closures. Not closure as in the JVM scripting language modeling of the list. Now the closure actually is actually a concept that is actually to to what do you call that to create a function with some sort of context. Now, so imagine the first line you say that you create an immutable value with the number three, and then you say that def lambda takes in a uh, an object of some integer, and then I will say that oh actually I just want to add these two numbers together. Now ignoring this part for now. What you're trying to say is that lambda will tie to x. The x here refers to this guy. You close, in academic literature, they call it closing over the variable, okay? But remember, in uh, when I showed you a few slides ago, immutability, you need to be very careful. You have to know what you are closing over. Now, if this guy becomes a var, and you close over, and this guy, the you know, initial value is 3, this guy, and then subsequently you change it to 7, when lambda is being fired, it will have a different value, right? So this is a very powerful technique that we often use when we want to take a function and a context, and I'll take this function and throw it out to some other computational object. Okay? Sorry. Yes. Your, this concept exists in Ruby that is blocks which you can execute in a closure in a different context. Oh, okay. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So you just said that uh, Ruby has a similar concept of uh, creating a closure around variables and objects as well. Okay, it's the same thing as over here as well. Any questions? Since I really get the concept, okay. The, the next thing is the lambdas. Lambdas are actually uh, unnamed functions. What do you mean by that? Uh, this is a name. I gave it a name called lambda. So over here I say that g takes in some function that takes in an integer and returns an integer. Okay. Over here, this is the syntax for a lambda. Because there's no name. I'm just giving it the body of the function. Okay, so this succeeds, this succeeds, and this fails. Uh, I will encourage you, I will not tell you why it failed. It's actually quite an interesting case. Um, it actually relates to the idea of uh, partial functional application. So we won't go into this, but I encourage you to run it on a repo and see and understand why it's like this. Okay, any other questions on this? So the, the key concept here is actually you can define functions that has no name just to do something quickly. Now the important thing is never to litter all this shit inside your code. Okay, because probably I know where you live and uh, you know, probably well, you live not on your door. The reason is because this thing is not maintainable. It is not testable, right? When you write code, you need to test it. How do you test an unnamed function? You can't. So you need to, don't ever do this, but it's like a, like a tool, right? It's like a library of tools. You open it up, there'll be shit tools, there'll be good tools, you know, things like this. But it's something that you should be aware of. Okay, the next thing is uh, matching. Matching in Scala is uh, very powerful. Uh, in Java slang, it's known as the visitor pattern. So in Java, you can, uh, you know, do, it actually, implements the visitor pattern, looks into it, and then searches for something. My Scala syntax is actually much cleaner. So over here, what I'm trying to do is actually create a data structure called a tree. And in this case, it's a balanced tree. Why? Now, I will create a type called tree, and then I will tell it a branch actually has a value, has a left tree and a right tree. Then I will say the leaf is also part of the tree. 
right? Now, when I'm, why this is important is because uh, often it occurs in Google interviews, Facebook interviews, so you might as well know what a tree is. Most of the things that they ask about trees are like, you know, optimizing trees, splitting trees, or how to, how to basically traverse a tree. Now, in order to traverse, though, it's actually a depthless search, right, in your data structures 101. This is how you can actually write uh, pattern matching code in Scala itself. So, inside this code, right, you basically say, define the function called in order, takes in a tree, and I want to do one thing, it's actually to string all the elements together. That means I need to go into each branch, pick up the value, and then piece them into a list. So how do I do that? So in Scala, what I can do is actually to, to say that whenever I pass the tree, I will start matching it. If I see a branch, I pull out the value, and I go left and go right. Okay, so you have a tree, it sees the branch, it picks up the value, and starts traversing the left first, before it goes to the right. This is a syntax for it. This is how you do tree traversal. I will encourage you to uh, code this in Java and, uh, and break your balls while you're doing it. Okay, and then you say when you see the leaf, right, the leaf of the tree, you do nothing. You return the new. Because when news return, in here or here, this whole expression becomes a list. Then you have a, a list of all the values. So this concept exists in all of the functional programming languages. Maybe the syntax is a bit different. Some like it, some don't. You know, you have to pick for something that you like. Any questions on the matching? Oh crap! I, I actually overran. So uh, overran, man. Okay, crap. Mm. I still have a few more things. So uh, okay. Uh, sorry. Wait. The next one is fifteen minutes away. <laughs> okay. All right. I have to apologize. Um, okay. I see two ways. Now I've overran my session. Uh, you uh, you have the freedom of uh, you know skipping off to hop to the next session, or you can stay on and see what I have to say. It's okay by me. Oh shit! The next session's here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am so sorry. Okay, um, in that case, I'm. Uh, can I have just maybe give me one more minute one more minute and uh, maybe I'll just go through um, some of the, the other concepts so right. okay I think maybe not the, the speaker is already here and you will probably kick me to death okay um, I'm so sorry that I overran the, uh, the session itself uh, but there are still some unfinished slides then I'll post them up uh, together with my email address and uh, hopefully uh, we can have some email you know, exchanges between us, okay? All right, thank you.